Tonight, it's Superboy versus Dr. Psycho, and by versus, I mean they kind of meet for like one panel, maybe. The Suicide Squad has one of its members die, which, yeah, that's kind of the point. And Deathstroke, Team 7, and the Ravagers figure out that if you can't sell one book, you just spread the plot over all three of them. Thanks for that, DC. All that and more tonight on the Not So New 52. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 80 of the Not So New 52. I am your host and it's a light week. You know me, you know I enjoy my light weeks. It's not that I don't enjoy doing this show or reading comics, but it's the fact that I try to keep myself to a pretty narrow time scale on how long I want these episodes to be. And when DC decides to do 17 comics in one week, it puts a lot of pressure on me. But luckily, this week is not one of those weeks. It's only 12 comics, and those 12 comics are the number 18 issues of Batgirl, Batman, Batman and Robin, Superboy, Green Lantern Corps, Deathstroke, Suicide Squad, and Demon Knights, along with Ravagers number 10, Team 7 number 6, Threshold number 3, and Katana number 2. A couple things to note out of that. The only real event comic we have is Green Lantern Corps, which is again Wrath of the First Lantern. Of course, there's also the Requiem comics, which I'm not counting as an event, but those cover the Bat books. And uh, something super weird is that Superboy this week had a backup. Now, I usually hold off for fifth weeks to talk about backups, and this is no exception, but the Superboy backup had absolutely nothing to do with Superboy at all. It was following Crypto, and it was like a page and a half long. So I don't know why they're just throwing more work at me for the sake of it, but stop it. I don't, just stop it. But that does lead to one point I wanted to bring up. Uh, I've been waiting for fifth weeks to do backups because there's usually not a lot of comics on fifth weeks. But I looked ahead on the schedule and we're not supposed to get another fifth week for like months. And they've already been building up for like months. So I'm really concerned that if I don't start bleeding out these backup stories a little bit beforehand, we're going to have like a four hour episode, which may sound great to you, but I can't talk that long and I don't want to film that. So don't worry about me. I'm looking into it. We'll see how it manages to shake out, though. Anyway, that's enough for me. You're not here to hear about all the behind the scenes stuff. You're here for comics. And so let's lead off with the single event of this week, Green Lantern Corps. Green Lantern Corps number 18, written by Peter Tomasi, art by Criss Cross. This is next part of Wrath of the First Lantern, and it's pretty much the same as it was last issue, where last issue we focused on, here's all the different paths that Guy Gardner could go down. This one is focusing on Jon Stewart. And also, Fatality is there, but she's kind of a non-entity, so... We open up with First Lantern just basically being like, you know, when I came across emotion, no one else had it. Like, I was the first thing that had emotion. But then I realized a lot of you guys nowadays really thrive off of emotion. So that's making this so much more interesting to go through all of your histories. And he dives into Jon Stewart and decides to go back to his mother, who I guess was running to be a senator or a a governor or something like that, and she was shot. And that is apparently what actually happened, and he uh, proceeded to join the army afterwards. However, he says, well, what if that didn't happen? And then we see her, John intervenes, stops the gunman. Uh, she ends up being elected to Senate and then apparently to vice president. And then John Stewart just works as an architect. And it's like, well, that's kind of boring. Anyway, let's try something else. So then we see, all right, he gets the Green Lantern ring when he's out in the desert. And we cut to the part where he allows an entire planet to die. Planet of Zash Zanshi, which is in canon. That did happen. Uh, apparently something about the yellow impurity. He didn't 
know about it and he let a whole planet die and afterwards he became somewhat suicidal and in actual continuity he's like no i'm doubling down and i'm going to be an even better green lantern because of this failure but then first lantern's just like okay but what if you shot yourself and john's like that's I, okay what if i shot i'd be dead that's what would happen he's like yeah but like it could have happened and then he turns over to Fatality and be like, all right, and what about her? And he's like, all right. So we see a fight scene between the two of them, and Fatality impales John on her weapon, which I don't know if that happened, but I'm assuming not considering that John's not dead. Uh, and we see his ring fly off. And then First Lantern's like, you know, you guys got this weird thing going on because Fatality, I didn't know this, is the last survivor of Zanshi, and that's why she's kind of miffed at Jon Stewart. Uh, but he's like, yeah, you got a weird thing going on here, so what if we make this love even more tragic? And we see that he gets impaled still, but then Jon uses his ring to grab Fatality, whip her around onto her own weapon that's still sticking out of her back, and then they both die. And he's like, yeah, all right, that's grim. Let's move on to something else. So, apparently at one point, Jon Stewart was offered the ability to become an Alpha Lantern, who, as we know in the course of this book, are like internal affairs for Green Lanterns. And he turned it down, but then in this scenario, he decided to accept it. And he gets some sort of crazy-ass surgery to become this almost like a knight-looking guy. And he goes around and just kills a bunch of Green Lanterns for breaking rules, including... I believe Kilowog and Guy Gardner. And John's like, okay, but that I I didn't do that. I didn't let them do that to me. And First Lantern's like, okay, but I can kind of piece together like your thing. You think that you are the guy who always makes the right decision, even if it's not easy. That's you. That's what you feel like you are. But there are other decisions. I've literally shown you other decisions that could have been made. So let's let's just let's just take this to its logical extreme. Uh, Mogo was taken over by Krona, and it allowed the entire Green Lantern Corps to be taken over. And John's like, "No, it didn't. I blew up Mogo. We literally just dealt with that two issues ago." And he's like, "Right." But the whole reason that it didn't happen that way is that, and I'm a little bit confused. This is pre New Fifty Two. He was a indigo tribe member and he used a gun that was a black lantern weapon and shot mogo and at this point kyle who's a blue lantern for some reason shows up and he's like john you can't do this and he's like i have to do this and so he was going to shoot mogo but then in this reality flips around and shoots kyle in the head and John's like, I wouldn't shoot Kyle. And he's like, I mean, if Kyle stood in your way, you're so determined you were right. But hey, let's let's see what I mean by another option here. And he rewinds the clock, and Kyle's like, you can't do this. And he's about to take the shot. But then Kyle stops him. He, he physically stops John from taking the shot, and then proceeds to save the day by taking Krona into custody and not having to kill Mogo. And so First Lantern's like, see? You thought you made the right decision there, but Kyle managed to make it so much better and Mogo didn't have to die. That's on you, buddy. Let's also check this other one here. And we go back to the first arc of this series where he is held captive by the, uh, those guys that were in charge of the lanterns. I can't remember their names, but, you know, they're asking for the force field code and Kurt is like, I'm sorry, I have to give them the code. I'm betraying the Green Lantern Corps. And John snaps his neck. And then First Lantern's like, well, I just, let's just see maybe if we change the series here. Let's see what else could have happened here. And instead of Kurt speaking up, now John speaks up. And he's like, I'm sorry, Kurt. I have to give him the code. And Kurt's like, no, you can't do it. And Kurt snaps John's neck. And he's like, see, you just like killing people. You just, you just like having people die. That's you. That's the soldier in you. And it seems like no matter what you do, every single one of your choices always ends up in the same place. And we see John being marched into the execution chamber on Oa. And he is destroyed and vaporized by the Guardians. And First Lantern's like, okay, well, I've gotten quite a bit out of you two. 
And I'm just here to let you know that these aren't just alternate realities that could have been. If I want them to be them, they will be them. And that's where the issue ends. Um, full disclosure, I'm not as familiar with Jon Stewart's history as other Lanterns. Uh, I've, most of this was pretty much new to me. I think that it's a good way to go through the character's history when you didn't know exactly like, oh, what were their darkest moments and stuff like that. But it's also a bit confusing as to what of the stuff actually did happen. Because like, did I get that he blew up Mogo, but I don't think he shot Kyle in the face. But like, I don't know what actually happened there. We didn't see the series of events for like those last two or three that what actually happened before the first lantern changed it. All in all, though, it is kind of just the same as the last issue. And something that I was a bit concerned about where it's just going to be us marching through the, oh, here's the what if of what your life could have been if things were a little different. And it's like, all right, well, I guess it's fun. But at the same time, if it goes on for even like one more issue, if we do it for like, I don't know, Kilowog next, I'm just going to be bored. So hopefully we can turn this into an actual plot before too long. But otherwise, yeah, art's fine. Writing's fine. It's not bad on its own. It's only in the context of I've seen this shtick with, like, two other books so far, so maybe we could change it up. I'm going to give it a... I'll give it just a flat 7. It's not great, not bad, just pretty average overall. Batman and Robin, number 18, written by Peter Tomasi, art by Patrick Gleason. This is... The story after Damien died in Batman Incorporated. And it's like, yeah, how are we supposed to continue on Batman and Robin without Robin? And this issue is told completely void of any dialogue. So we open up Bruce Wayne. He's sitting by the fire. He's just staring into it. And we see it's in Robin's room and his cot is completely empty. He makes his way over to Robin's journal where he sees that... Damien's been sketching a whole bunch of stuff, and uh, he sees that there is a note inside of Damien's journal from someone named C.K. as their initials, and it says, I'm sure you'll enjoy these, and it's a whole bunch of, as far as I can tell, books or movies? Hard to say. So... We go down to the library. Alfred is crying over the unfinished portrait that they had made. The only one left to be painted in was Damien. And Bruce walks in, sees him crying over it. He covers it with a sheet and takes it down because he doesn't want to see it anymore. So then Bruce slides down the bat pole into the bat caves. He looks over at the other pole and sees Damien next to him. Only to realize, of course, he's not actually there. Uh, he goes to Damien's costume cubby or whatever. He holds the glove of Robin and then puts on his own cowl with a big old frown on his face. And then makes his way out into the city. And as he's jumping around rooftop to rooftop, he keeps on thinking. He sees glimpses of Robin next to him. Uh, but as he tries to get a full vision of it, it he always realizes it's not there. Uh, then we get a panel where, well, I guess first is a page where he's in the Batmobile. Same thing. Thinks he sees Damien. But then when he looks over and Damien's not there, he gets pissed. Like, he's angry that this keeps happening. So he just busts past a whole bunch of, like, light poles and stuff like that. Completely destroys them. And then we get a two-page spread of Batman just terrorizing criminals. Like, he is on a bender right now. And Jim Gordon gets a call from Bullock super early in the morning. Bat signals on. They make their way to the rooftop. And it's just full to the brim of criminals just tied up and waiting there for them. So... Later that night, he gets home. I think this is Titus is the dog. Titus is waiting for him. Batman pushes past him, takes a shower. Uh, he makes his way over to the costume cubbies again. But this time, he, uh, he sees a letter waiting for him. And he opens it up, and inside, it's a letter from Damien saying, like, Hey, I'm sorry that I disobeyed your orders in Batman Incorporated. I went off to go fight your mom, or go fight my mom. Uh... And he says, I want you to know that mother may have given me life, but you taught me how to live. Love and respect your son, Damien. And Batman just loses it, like, angrily. He's just 
punching everything. All of the costumes go flying. His knuckles get bruised. You see Titus cowering in the corner. And the final page is Bruce just embracing the costume of Damien and just crying. It's a dark issue, man. This is I mean, this issue had to happen, right? This issue needed to be the follow-up to what it was. Because we had that issue... Just beforehand, the last one was this dream sequence of like, oh, things could be good. And they they shared this moment together, but it was only in a dream. And then this happened. And yeah, like it, it, it did it great. The fact that there's no dialogue, you still follow it all perfectly. Um, I think my only critique, and it's super minor, is the fact that... Uh, on the pages just before he goes on his bender of just beating up a whole bunch of uh, villains, every panel within themselves look fantastic, but I kind of lose the flow a little bit. It just feels more like a series of still images rather than a story being told, but I get it. It's an emotionally traumatic night for him. He's having issues, so I'm not going to critique it that hard. All in all, this issue is fantastic. Um, I can't say, you know, it, it doesn't do anything to forward a story. It is 100% an emotional piece, but it hits the emotions dead on. And as fast of a read as it is, it's still great. So I got to give this one like an, I want to say 8.5, but it's really bordering on that 9. But I think I'm going to keep it at just an 8.5. I can't tell you exactly why, though. It just, it doesn't feel quite at that 9 level, but it is fantastic. I do highly suggest checking it out but of course it comes with its own baggage of you got to read batman incorporated beforehand so either way it's good batman number 18 written by scott snyder and james tanyan the fourth art by andy kubert and alex maleev so robin's still dead that happened and now we're dealing with it and this is an issue as are i believe all the issues that james tynion is working on is uh following harper Rowe, who we see here with her brother driving to blackgate penitentiary in order to meet up with their father who has been imprisoned here recently and harper really doesn't want to go but her brother cullen does and so they make their way up there and they meet up with the dad and Cullen's explaining how he's, you know, working on this new magazine. It's a literary journal. It's called Larynx. And he's, like, trying to get his dad excited for him. He's like, no, dad, I'm, I'm the youngest editor they've ever had. And he's like, yeah, yeah, that's cool. Hey, let me hear from my other daughter making fun of the fact that uh, Cullen is gay. And Cullen does not take it well. He goes off for a second to use the bathroom. And Harper just unloads on him, being like, you are such a dick. He is literally the only reason we're here. I wouldn't care if you rotted in here. And the dad's like, yeah, okay. Look, I know I'm only in here because you sent your special friend after me, so back off. And she starts getting into it like, what do you mean special friend? I don't know. I have no idea what you're talking about. And the guard says their time is up and he goes about and he's genuinely just an ass this entire time. So then we go back to the Narrows, where because of the restoration project, everyone from the Narrows is put up into hotels, and uh, we see that Cullen and Harper are staying at this hotel, and Harper is getting prepped to go out for the night. She's got, like, utility belt and everything, and she's like, hey, look, I'm, I'll am i be safe. Don't worry about me, uh, but maybe we should never see Dad again, and Cullen's like, fine, whatever. I don't care, and she does a little bit to cheer him up and it works and then she's like all right well i'll be out there so it turns out that harper's been able to use her knowledge of the gotham's electrical system to basically track batman this entire time she keeps on changing up the encryptions and whatnot but she's constantly able to figure out exactly where he is at any given moment and we see her getting on top of a rooftop very slowly mind you all things considered and she just waits for him. And then all of a sudden, this criminal comes running out this door, screaming, help me, followed by the Batmobile breaking through the wall. And we see him, Batman, jump out and basically threaten the crap out of this criminal. And Harper goes through the thing saying, yeah, uh, something happened to Batman. 
he has been working nonstop, night and day, for like five days now. And I don't know what's going on, but he is going to burn himself out soon. So I'm just trying to keep an eye on him. And we see her unloading all this exposition onto her brother, saying, like, he's going to get himself killed. He hasn't slept in five nights. Just the other night, some random drunk in an alley managed to get a knife in his leg. A drunk managed to shiv Batman. That shouldn't be happening. And Cullen's like, well, I mean... He's Batman. He can take it. It's like, yeah, but for how long? All it takes is one guy he's not expecting, someone who actually does have an edge, and Batman's done for. And lo and behold, we cut to a man who is having some dogs take serums of venom in order to turn them into malicious killers. And Batman breaks in through the window and threatens the guy saying, tell me where the next dog fight is. And the guy whistles and says, how about right here, right now? Dog jumps out, attacks Batman, and he's like, yeah, I'm using Venom, which is able to basically give these dogs the crushing power of their, in their jaws as the same as, like, a tiger. So Batman's armor is being shattered by this dog's jaws. He has enough to get one of them repelled, but then this guy reveals he's got a whole kennel full of them, and he lets them all go on Batman. And Batman throws in battle rings. They do nothing against them. But then Harper comes in, and she basically turns on a super-powered dog whistle that knocks all the dogs out and has them running. And she kicks the uh, guy in the face and says, like, oh, I'm a teenage girl who's about to kick your butt. And she uses a t taser to zap him in his junk. And as he's about to get up to attack her, Batman knocks him out. And she's like, hey... I know what you're going to say, Batman, but I have been doing some training, so it's not like I'm totally unarmed here. And Batman's like, oh, you've been doing training? Cool, block this. And he just punches her through a fence, and he basically tells her, hey, your training means nothing. Like, these are lives on the line. You think that I was going to, what, take you back to my base, tell you my real name, take you in as a sidekick? No. People die doing this and that's why you're not allowed to do it anymore and harper just stands up like i'm not an idiot i don't care about your name i don't want you to be a real person i want you to be the batman i just saw that you were going down this road like you were about to die there that was going to happen until i stepped in you are not in an okay place and that's why i came in here and also I know that you give a crap about me because you put my dad behind bars, apparently. I never even asked you to do that. So what's going on here? And he's like, look, I don't give a damn about you. I don't care about you at all. But you're done. You ever come out again, I'm going to treat you like a criminal. And so he flies off. The next day, uh, she's got a busted nose because of Batman's punch. And she's like, I, I can't just give up on Batman. And she makes a plan to basically get him to realize that he's at his wit's end here. But it first involves going to Wayne Tower, where Bruce Wayne, turns out he crashed there for the night. Lucius Fox caught him, and so he's forced to play pretend Bruce Wayne for a while before he gets back out on the street. And his secretary comes in and says, uh, there's a young girl here who is kind of super eager to see you. And Bruce is like, oh, God, okay, yeah, send her in. And... He's like, hey, look, I, I don't deal with the Narrows Project, Miss Rowe. I know all about your thing. You want to talk to this guy down the third floor. I'm really busy. You should probably leave. And he, she's like, oh, uh, yeah, sorry. I guess, sorry. And she starts to leave. And then Bruce is like, okay, sorry. I'm being a bit of a dick. Why did you come here today? And Harper's like, hey, I know that you fund Batman Incorporated, so you at least have some interest in Batman, even if it's just financial. He's not okay. We need to do something, and I have this plan laid out. And she lays out these whole schematics, and she's like, look. And Bruce basically tells her, look, no matter what you say, I'm on it. Like, I agree. Maybe Batman does need some help right now. So send this down to the engineers, and I'll tell them I greenlit anything. So that night, Harper's waiting on a rooftop. Batman comes up and is like, I'm sorry I punched you in the face. And she's like, ah, it's whatever. I had to come in sooner or later. And... Apparently, we give some backstory on how Harper's mother was murdered uh, by someone, though we don't get exactly who. And she basically says, yeah, my mom 
she, you know, she had these dark moments herself. She fell into these, but she had her ways of dealing with it. And I think that you could really use that right now. So it's a whole lot of back and forth of building up the character. But basically what it all results to is she's saying like, well, just look over at Wayne Tower and it, it's going to, it's the one word that my mother used to calm herself down. Just one word and I'm hoping that it could do the same thing for you. Um, I'm going to jet this moment just for you alone. And Batman's like, hey, don't worry about it. I'm already calm. Like, you've done a lot for me. Thank you. And as she leaves, the word is resolve. That's the name of the issue. But we see that the building is got the big letter R on it. So even without it meaning to be Robin, it means Robin. Um, I really enjoyed this issue. I think that it's good that you know we have these bigger story arcs we have you know death of the family court of owls stuff like that but we can take these smaller moments here and i like that we've pinned just a normal face in gotham normal in so much as it could really be to have these sort of over the shoulder stories where we're seeing batman from another perspective so i enjoyed it i think it's perfectly good story uh art wise uh, Andy Kubert and Alex Maleev are not good at imitating each other if they were even trying to, so there's a very sudden shift in the middle, but both styles independently are fine. Um, so overall, I'll give this one a... I'll give it like a good 7.5. It feels good. It's a nice story. Um, yeah, I think the only real criticism here is the fact that the word resolve is not printed in the trade version, so when she says there's a single word, it's going to cycle through everything. It's just not there. And you have no idea what she's talking about. It's only in the actual issue itself where they keep all the titling that it makes any sense. So points off for that, but 7.5 overall. Batgirl number 18, written by Ray Fox, art by Daniel Sempier. So last issue, Batgirl got quote-unquote incinerated by a guy named Firebug, who was targeting some cops. And uh, this issue is told entirely narratively-wise through James Gordon Jr., as I think the last issue was as well. But basically it opens up with, no, Batgirl was actually caught in that fire, and, like, the entire apartment building she was in is being brought down because of the explosion. And Junior is looking up at it and basically reminiscing. I'm like, you know, Gotham really likes to kill its heroes. Like, this is it chews them up, it spits them out, and it doesn't make them any better for wear. And just so everyone's aware, this is still part of Requiem, the fact that Robin, Damian Wayne, died, and... They're kind of dealing with it in this sort of thing of like, oh no, Batgirl's also assumedly dead because this entire apartment complex came down around her. And even Junior's like, well, I didn't want her to die here. I, I mean, I, I want to be the one that kills her. In fact, she dies here. Man, that's awful. So once the complex comes down, the cops are saying like, everyone stay back. We got to make sure it's safe. And people come up and they're like, nah. That girl was a hero, and we got to get in there and save her. You mess with one of us, you mess with all of us. So they get in there, they start clearing out the rugged, the, the rubble, that's the word. And the, as they are working on it, Junior also joins in. He's like, oh, I can't let Barbara die like this. But then all of a sudden, Batgirl just throws off some of the rubble, and she's totally fine. I mean, she's very beaten up, but she's alive at least. So then we cut to GCPD where a bunch of the Joker goons from last issue have been locked up and they're all totally throwing each other under the bus, but nobody's saying anything about Joker himself. And then Jim Gordon gets a message uh, about the cop being blown up and just like, oh, it was a tenement fire down the street. This is horrible stuff, whatever. But then he gets a message from Batman saying, meet up on the roof. And he gets up there and basically Batman just tells Jim, hey, Robin's dead. Like, we're just letting you know now. So Jim, he then pulls out his phone later on in his office. He calls Barbara and passes the message on to her saying like, hey, Robin's dead. I don't know what's going to be going on in this city over the next few nights, but I need to know you're at least safe. I mean, if it's able to kill a kid like that, that's messed up. 
and we see Barbara. She's like, I don't know what to say. Oh, it's, it's that's awful, but don't worry, I'll be safe. And so Jim gets off the phone, and she has a little moment of sadness. She's like, oh, Bruce, I'm so sorry. And then she calls up uh, Grayson, and he basically answers, says, like, hey, Barbara, really can't talk right now. And she's like, uh, I heard about Damien. And he's like, right, yes, and I want to talk about it, but I really can't talk right now. I'll call you back. And he hangs up. And then we just get back into the story proper where she analyzes one of the bricks that came from the rubble. She is trying to get some lockdown on where the accelerant came from when all of a sudden she gets a call from Junior and he's like, hey, I didn't want you to die in that building. I was even digging that for you. And she's like, you're the one who put me with the Joker last arc. And he's like, and you made it out fine. Anyway, uh, I just want you to know that I, I, I'm going to get to you soon enough. Be looking over your shoulder. I'll be there soon. And so Batgirl gets suited back up again. And she has to make the decision, do I go after Firebug or do I go after Junior? And she logics out that Junior is only really a danger to her and like a few other people, whereas Firebug's a danger to the whole city. So she makes the call to do that instead as she gets the directive on where Firebug was getting his stuff from. So then we see uh, at the hospital where Barbara's mom is, Junior's dressed back up as a doctor and he's, she's, he's basically saying like, I'm going to kill her. I'm going to do that because she chose not to come to me first. But it turns out that the mother managed to bail out just before Junior got there. She took a cab and she left and Junior has no idea where she's headed. So cut over to Batgirl. She's triangulated the position of Firebug, breaks into his little base of operations and just starts throwing mad punches. She is not here for a talk right now. And he tries unleashing some more of the fire stuff, but she's come prepared with some, as far as I can tell, fireproof blankets that she just keeps on throwing over these explosives. And she takes one of the grenades and basically shoves it back into his suit. And he's like, no, I don't want to die like this. And he's like, oh, don't worry, you're not going to die. And she covers it up again with one of the blankets and says like, now, who do you work for? What are you doing? Either way, the police are going to figure it out. So, puts him into police custody, and then she's like, all right, time to go deal with Junior. So, starts tracing the signal back to where it was come last sensed at, and it comes to this broken-down suburban neighborhood, and she notices one of the buildings has a window smashed in. And Junior's narration is like, surely she wouldn't be so stupid to go in through the smashed window, and then she did. And Junior's like, wow, all right, maybe I've been giving her too much credit. Maybe this isn't, like, actually all that hard. And she follows this beeping noise uh, down the steps into, as far as she tells, the kitchen. And as she gets down there, she sees written in blood on the walls, Hello, Barbara, nice try, as there's a bat pinned to the wall along with the cell phone that she was tracing. So then we see across the street, uh, Junior is inside of this, as far as I could tell, children's bedroom. And he's using the phone there and saying, All right, hey, uh, Mom is that you? And she's like, Junior, how did you know me? And she's like, oh yes, I went to go visit you in the hospital. Uh, here's the deal. I'm looking at Barbara right now, and I'm not only going to kill her, I'm going to make Dad eat her, unless you meet me at the aquarium. And so that's that's just how that's going to end up. That's the end of the issue, though. Um, okay, so first things first, the Requiem aspect of it. I think it's good. I think it's fine. I think that it was put into this issue maybe a little bit later into production. I feel like that's true for most of these books, though, is that it's the sort of thing where it's like, well, we can't really stop our whole story just for them to be like, oh, no, Damien. So this one feels, out of all the Requiem issues, the weakest in terms of dealing with it. But at the same time, I can't think of any time I've really even seen Damien and Barbara talk to each other. So... Eh, I guess it makes sense that it would be the weakest. Um, as for the junior stuff, I don't know. It feels so... It feels weird, the direction we're going with it, in that he wanted her to die. And he even mentions in this book, like, oh, if I had found you in that rubble, I could have just stabbed you in the back, and then I get to kill you, but everyone thinks you just died in the rubble. It would have been perfect. So he only wants her to die by his hands, which I get enough, but... 
I don't know, it just seems like this weird game of cat and mouse where he very easily could have been in that house that Barbara went into, but instead he's just keeping an eye on her, which it seems like he already has an omnipresent eye on her anyway. I don't know. It just seems a little bit, like, drawn out to me. I think that there was something in here that could have played out a good cat and mouse chase, but in the end it's just, like, two people who always know where the other one is constantly, and they just keep on missing each other somehow. So, yeah. Uh, it's a bit weak in that regard. But overall, I'm still enjoying the Junior stuff more than I've enjoyed most of the other Batgirl villains. So I'm going to give this one a... I'll give it a 6.5. It's almost a 7, but it is a 6.5. So not much more to really say about it. Just uh, I think the conclusion to Junior's arc is next week, so we'll see if they manage to wrap it up in a nice little neat bow. Superboy, number 18, written by Scott Lobdell, Tom DeFalco, and Tony Lee. Art by R.B. Silva and Iban Coelho. Which, for how little of a story there is in this book, I don't know how there's that many people working on it. So, Hell on Earth happened, and we never have to speak of it again, apparently, because Superboy is just back to exactly where he was before all of that happened, where he is returning all of the money that he stole before, which was like a million dollars, and apparently he's short a couple hundred thousand because, you know, living expenses. But he's putting it all away and he's saying, I'm going to turn myself into the police because I'm growing a conscious. When all of a sudden, a radioactive man named Plasmus... Plasmus has a German accent, by the way. And I only mention that because they make at least three different jokes about, oh, he sounds like Schwarzenegger this whole time. I'm going to spare that from you, but just know he speaks with a German accent. So he breaks into the vault, and he's like, oh, I'm going to be taking all of the money. And Superboy's like, well, I can't let you do that. And he's like, I'm, I can just kill you. Like, I'm superheated. Like, get out of here. So then Superboy and him start fighting. And that just goes on for the rest of the issue with no real change. The actual focus of this issue is Dr. Psycho who I always thought was a Wonder Woman villain, but is apparently here. And he, Dr. Psycho is acting as a psychic in downtown, sorry, midtown Manhattan. And he uses his abilities of mental probing and psychic stuff in order to give like a half-assed little psychic reading, but mostly steal people's like financial stuff and then rob them later so he's just breaking into this woman's mind and stealing her atm info when all of a sudden uh they they hear sorry dr psycho hears this fight going on outside and he's like oh sweet maybe there'll be aliens i could use their tech because last time i stole some alien tech it was from a alien that didn't have hands like us so i couldn't use it and then you see Superman fighting Plasmus, and he's just like, oh my god, I, I'm feeling all this telekinetic energy coming off of them. I want that energy, which I don't know if that's really a thing he has the ability to do, but apparently it is. So at that point, he is forcibly put into an astral form and goes inside of Superman's body, sorry, Superboy's body, without him even wanting to. And he sees Superboy inside of a vat of ooze and he's like is this like a metaphor of how we're all trapped in society or is this like an actual memory and then he sees outside of the vat are all of the teen titans all of the ravagers and also that dude from the beginning of the book with the like shade tentacle stuff i can't even remember his name anymore but regardless they're all there and it's like oh he he wants to be free he wants to join them but he's unable to oh i get the metaphor now and then all of a sudden he's forced out of his body and he literally flies past Superman, Superboy's brain and he feels one of the punches Superboy takes and suddenly he's back in his own body. And he's like, he is face to face with Superboy. Superboy's like, I'm sorry, who are you? And he's like, I'm Dr. Psycho. And he's like, I'm sorry, what? And he's like, never mind. And then the fight continues. And then Dr. Psycho puts together like, okay, but wait a minute. If I get back into that body, but instead I take the driver's seat, then I can control those telekinetic abilities. That's what I'll do. And so he gets back in there, but now instead of being in the 
happy fun time part that he was at before, he's in this dark void with a whole bunch of tendrils around him. And a voice reaches out saying, oh, I was wondering when you'd be here. I, I've been waiting for you. It's time to learn who you are. And it appears to be Lex Luthor in like a power suit that is telling the astral form of Dr. Psycho that. Just listen to that last sentence I said again and really take apart how little sense that makes. And that's basically the whole issue. Um, I don't even know where to begin here. Like, okay, let's just... Superboy's turning himself in because he grew conscious and now he's fighting a guy named Plasmus. Fine, whatever. That is literally the weakest framing device I could imagine. But then we throw in this idea of Dr. Psycho is inside of Superboy's conscience. And it sounds like next issue, he's going to learn Superboy's origin because this Lex Luthor part of his personality or something thinks that Superboy is Dr. Psycho. Or vice versa. Uh, sure. Why not? You know, after Hell on Earth made a little bit too much sense for a bit too long, they just had to throw out this whole thing of like, oh, but like, what if dumb? Uh, I guess you could tell I really don't enjoy this issue. It's not that it's awful writing. It is, though. There's one point in here where uh, the best one-liner that Superboy can come up with is made you look. And then he says like, hey, when you're fighting a supervillain, Louis C.K., you're not going to be. Which I could not think of a more dated line than that, if you paid me. Um, yeah, no, nah, it's just... I get they're setting up this other thing, but, like, Superboy himself has met up with at least three different people who can read minds. Why in the hell are we not just... Why do we have to introduce Dr. Psycho into the mix to get this to happen? Just... Go to any other one of the mind readers. Reintroduce them. Then you don't have to do the busy work of like, oh, we're introducing this new character as well. Because it's done so poorly here as well. Like, I have no idea what Dr. Psycho's mind powers are. Apparently, it's mind reading in astral form. But then he also thinks he can control telekinetic energy. I don't get it. This was a poor setup and a poor execution. So overall, I got to give this one like a 3.5. I'm not really enjoying any of it. Art, I will at least say, is competently done. I followed the story, but, like, this is the worst framing device for an origin setup I could ever imagine. Threshold number three, written by Keith Giffen, art by Tom Rainey and Phil Winslade. Last issue, we had Captain k -Rot threading Blue Beetle over to Jedi Call, and because Blue Beetle and Green Lanterns have beef, they Blue Beetle immediately started attacking. Anyway, none of that really matters. So we open up, as all of these issues have, with some sort of, like, weird extra thing of The Hunted, where now we're in a chat room of a bunch of people talking about the show. It just kind of recaps what was happening and introduces... At least I think it introduces this new character named Lonar, who is a god of some sort and is also in the game. Uh, but then we cut over to k -Rot and his crew uh, stealing all the guns from this place as they originally intended to do, as Blue Beetle has been thrown off their trail. And they have this running gag here of, I can't even remember her name, I think it's Sleen, but I, it's like 50-50 chance there. Uh, Sleen is the girl cat, maybe? I don't know. Regardless, she's got beef with K-Rot constantly saying misogynistic things and tries shooting at him repeatedly. Anyway, Jedi sees this and just be like, K-Rot, I hate you, and I'm gonna come back for you. I swear it. So then we get a whole chase scene of him running down through the town. Uh, the scarab suit is chasing after him because if you remember, Jaime is actually unconscious in there and the scarab is just acting on his own. And everyone's like, oh my god, are we on the show? This is great. Hey, we might be on the show. But then as they make their way through, Beetle's just kind of like killing everybody in the way. So not happy for too long. And Jedi is just looking for anybody to give him some sort of weapon that he can use against the Beetle. Uh, but it, the only thing he manages to get out of it is a meat cleaver. And so he manages to make his way into a back alley where he's immediately stopped by a hunting crew 
that are like, hey, we saw you on the stream and we're we're going to take you out. We're going to get the bounty when all of a sudden the beetle comes out. And they're like, oh, Jesus Christ, we got to kill that thing first. But then they remember the beetle is still in its first 24 hours, which is the grace period. So they aren't actually able to do anything against it without being thrown into the game themselves. So at that moment, Jediah makes his escape and Jaime wakes up and he's like, wait a minute. Last thing I remember, there was a rabbit or something. Like, where am I? What's going on? And they're like, uh, nothing. We're going to go. And they all run off. And Jaime's like, uh, did my suit just like move without me? Because that ain't cool if that's the case. And he flies off and Jediah's like, all right, I, I got to do something to deal with this. This ain't good for my health. When all of a sudden he's met up by, I can't even remember their names, but they were at the very beginning and were trying to convince him to join this like group thing to stop the hunted uh so basically they say hey we saw you uh i'm a private detective we saw you on the stream and i managed to track down exactly where you are we can't talk here though we got to get you cloaked and so they provide him a cloaking device that turns him into a red-headed woman because why not and they go walking down the street and they basically explain like yeah here's the deal um we know where your power battery is. We know how to get to it. So maybe you should stick with us. And Jedi is like, mm, tell me more. So then we cut over to K-Rod again. They're loading up a ship with all the weapons and crap they got. And I forgot the name already. Sleen is basically chewing him out for putting them in danger because his egotism is getting in the way and all that stuff. And he's just like, hey... I don't have an ego. I just think I'm really good at everything I do. And she chews him out for uh, selling out Jediah. And it's like, look, we're not friends anymore. Not after what just happened there. And apparently K-Rod's really pissed off that he lost his leg. And he's still looking to get revenge on the guy who took it. And then Sleen calls him out for hanging out with a guy named Branks Rancor. Who's apparently the one who's making him misogynistic. And he doesn't know the meaning of the word. So then she defines it. And he's like... Okay, and your point is? So then they start getting fired at again. And I say they because there's also pig iron there. So then this random dude shows up, and he wants to talk to them. And he's just like, oh, I can give you uh, 50,000 credits. And he's like, all right, you're really going to make me stop? Fine, whatever. He reaches out his head, apologizes to Selene, and that makes her stop shooting. And the guy hands over an image of the power battery and says, we want you to get this. And... He's, the K-Rot's like, oh, is your guy a collector? Because it's not going to be any use without the ring. Like, I hope you understand that. And he's like, oh, yeah, you could you could say collector. So then we cut over to Stealth, who is in a bar along with Space Ranger, and she's just devouring a bunch of food. And she's, like, everyone's apparently getting grossed out with how fast she's eating. But then she's like, all right, look, I'm done. What do I owe you? And it's like, oh, well, you don't notice anything. I'm not talking about credits. I mean, you brought me here for a reason. What's up? And basically they make the point that this is a safe zone. There's like, there's no way that anyone, it's a blind spot that the system can't find them with. And so it's like, nah, that doesn't exist. Cause like they're constantly checking up on their targets to make sure that they are not in, you know, hospitality. And she gets a brief flashback of some family being arrested, which leads me to believe that She's already been in a quote-unquote safe zone before, so she's like, yeah, I'm not going to stay. Then they call her her actual name, Pamiera Sin, which, not too fond of. Uh, one of the girls keeps on just basically heckling her the whole time, and so Stel's like, I'll talk to you guys if we throw her out of the bar. And so they do. And the girl's pissed off about it. It's like, all right, screw it, whatever, you're a psycho anyway. So then they get to the actual plan, and the actual plan is, hey, look, we've got fans. Being a member of the show, also a blonde dude walks in, who I know I've seen before, but screw me if I try to remember it. Uh, We've got fans. They love to watch us. What if we could turn our fans against the show because they'll listen to us. They'll hear out what we have to say. We just have to use our celebrity status for a higher goal. And she's like, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. I'm out. And she leaves and just like, oh, yeah, no, so she's definitely on board. Space Ranger's like, uh, it doesn't seem like it. It's like, well, it could have been worse. She could have been laughing on her faces. And as she's leaving, we see she gets jumped by the girl who got thrown out of the bar earlier. And then we get last 
two pages here. Jaime's sitting on a roof. He's got his scarab armor a little bit down. And he's like, I don't like the fact that I was piloted when I was unconscious. That makes me really uncomfortable. Also, I'm on a show where I'm being hunted. And then all of a sudden, this dude shows up right next to him. And he's just like, hey, uh, I want to talk to you, but I need you to lower down your armor. And he's like, um, excuse me, I'm going to keep my armor on because I am a deadly threat with it. And I feel more comfortable with that. And then this guy just immediately disarms him and holds some blades to his throat and be like, I'd rather not kill you if that's okay. And he's like, yeah, no, cool. Armor going down. And it turns out this guy is Lonar, and he wants to talk to him because there's something that they are able to work together on. But yeah, Lonar thinks he's a god. Here's the biggest problem I'm having with this book, and I think I probably said something similar last issue. It's that it's introducing so many characters, so many new things, but it's not spending enough time on any given one of them to make me feel like I'm actually familiar with them. So every time it cuts to a new thing, I'm like, who are these people? What are they doing? Like that blonde guy who walked in. I know I've seen him before. I know for a fact that he's been in this book. I couldn't begin to tell you what his name is or what his overall purpose is in this book. It means nothing to me because there's jumping around too many different plots. Honestly, I'd cut the K-Rot thing entirely. It's out of place. It's weird. Focus on the other characters more. Maybe it'll turn out to be something bigger in the end, but right now it just seems like the comedic relief storyline, and it's not really needed. So, yeah, I gotta give this one... I gotta give it, like, just a straight five. And it's really disappointing to me. I really wanted this book to be something cool. Um, doing, like, you know, it's Hunger Games. Hunger Games was literally coming out as this book was being written, so clearly it's the same thing, but it is still some something fresh in the dc universe and i just wish it was handled a bit more deftly i guess so yeah five overall we'll see if they can turn it around next issue Katana number two, written by Anne Nascenti, art by Alex Sanchez. Last issue, Katana was attacked by the Sword Clan and seemingly held this one guy at uh, Sword Point, I guess you want to call it, and says, oh, I'm going to be part of my own clan. So this issue picks up. Sorry, the guy was Coil. That's right. Coil at Sword Point. And so they're like, okay, you don't want to join Sword Clan? And it's like, no, I, I don't want to do that. And they're like, should we keep fighting her? And Coil's like, D didn't you know? Nowadays, no means no. So they all just scatter to the winds. And I just want to point out that one line because it's said with so much sarcasm that I can't even begin to process the deeper meaning behind that. But regardless, everyone scatters and Katana's like, okay. I can't keep up with, like, all the actual ninjas, so I'm just going to follow their weakest and slowest member and see where that follows me. So it ends up being this basically kid who seems like he didn't even want to fight at all. And mind you, they're in the San Francisco Zoo at this point, and she's like, oh, you're hiding near the lion exhibit. I will cut you up and feed you to them. And he's just like, hey, no, I don't know. He's just, like, trying to keep away from her, not even swinging his sword. And she just keeps up all of the stuff. She's just like, oh, what's the matter? You don't know how to swing your sword? Hey, move your way over to the crocodile exhibit. They'll eat your rotten meat. You suck, dude. And the guy's like, hey, I don't want to fight. All right? I'm a pacifist. I, I, I don't even want to be here right now. And he's just like, now can we just talk? And she's like, oh, okay, yeah, sure. I guess we could do that. So they get up and they just sit over near the uh, Golden Gate Bridge. And it's just like, yeah. My name is Thrust. I'm a member of this prestigious family, and they've always been Sword Clan. But, you know, I don't want to fight. I want to be something better than that. So they kind of just call me Thrust as a joke now. And so Katana's like, cool. So do you want to be my spy? And he's like, yeah, sure. Whatever. I don't care. Why not? And so he, they introduce there's this party that's going to be going on, I think, that night. And... She can go as thrusts plus one. So that's going to be happening. And then he asks, like, hey, I know you have some history with Coil and something happened to you in Tokyo. And it's just like, yes, uh, it was this horrible thing. And there's a bunch of blood. And I just remember the feeling of flames on my feet and the knowing that my soul ticker sword did something very bad. And he's like, all right, cool. I'm going to introduce you to Sickle because he uses a sickle as his sword. 
in order to scoop out enemy hearts. So then Tatsu is like, hey, remember that tattoo girl? I want to go see more of her. Um, I need to see her face. And the lady who's acting as like the bouncer is like, oh, you want to see her face? That's $5,000. She's like, I have 200. It's like, okay, I'll let you see her foot. And on her foot is a dragon tattoo. And she's like, dragons, that's not even real. You cheated me. Give me back my money. And then she says, uh, one present, two past, three the best. That's as real as it gets. And then she tells Tatsu to go get a job. So then Tatsu says, oh, I'm going to go talk to my landlady. She owns the bar. I'll just work there for some money. And then she has candy thrown at her by the local drunk over and over again. And she keeps on swatting them away. Until finally she kicks the sake out of the guy's hands and saying like, oh, you're, you're drunk on sake. But then it turns out that the dude is actually a martial arts master and he takes Tatsu down and manages to show her up entirely. And he makes the point of like, you underestimated me because of my appearance. You need to be learning the same. Also, the only thing you know is karate. Maybe you should learn some other martial arts as well. And she's like, fair enough. You seem very wise, actually. So can I ask you what that riddle that that lady gave me, the one present two past thing? And he's like, oh, third path could be future. Perhaps you've seen a piece of the future. And he's like, okay, dragons are the future. I don't get it, but regardless, we'll move on. So then she goes to the bar, asks her landlady for the job. Landlady's like, nah, I don't need a job. Like, I'm doing this fine on my own. And she's like, okay, well, how about this? I'll work for free today. I'll stop that fight that's about to break out at your bar. And then you'll hire me tomorrow because I did such a good job. Which we don't ever see if that works. But regardless, uh, she gets dressed for her date at the party thing, the gala. And turns out her wisdom that she took away from the drunk is, I'm going to dress in a blonde wig because everyone underestimates blondes so she makes her way in there and there's a sword fighting show up on stage and apparently it is customary at the end of the sword fighting display that members from the audience can come up and uh, have a friendly match of skill and so immediately she not only throws away the costume but she also gets into her katana outfit and says like i challenge you sickle and all of those other sword fighting cheerleader girls because yes they're cheerleading sword fighting girls. So she gets up there. She takes out the ladies. No problem at all. Although the soul taker sword sit, takes over her body again in the middle of it. And she's like, oh, I can't control myself. My hands are burning. Ouch, ouch, ouch. But she takes them all out. Not killing them, but, you know, disarming them. And then everyone claps for her. And Sickle's like, hey, congratulations. You beat all of us, including me. I totally was defeated. And she's like, I, I didn't even fight you. And he's like, yeah, no, hey, I get it. Look. You should join us in our little special clan thing. And she's like, I'll consider it, if only to keep my enemies closer. So then she's leaving that night, and she's accosted by somebody in the shadows. Turns out it's Colonel Steve Trevor, because if you forgot, Katana's a member of the Justice League of America. And Trevor's like, hey, uh, there's a problem going on with Catwoman in Gotham. We need you to fly back to America to deal with that real quick. So, uh, on your way. And... Then we get one last page of, in Gotham City, Killer Croc is going to fly to San Francisco because he heard about something about dragons and a sword that chopped down the last one. And it's probably the Soul Taker sword. Okay. All right. So this book is still finding its footing. It's very obvious it has not quite gotten fully done with its setup yet, and it's still trying to figure that out. If we're also having to balance the fact that she's in Justice League of America in her own book, I can't see this book making any sense before it ends up being canceled. It's not it's not doing like anything right now. On top of that, we're setting up like this mystery behind what Katana's past is. And that's fine. I'm okay with it being this whole thing of like, oh, why can't she control her sword? And what was this horrible tragedy that befell her? But it doesn't even feel like that's the focus. The focus feels so much more on she's just trying to fight a general vague gangland, gangland crime thing where there's always another enemy and her focus can be as vague as she wants it to be. 
I would just like a little more focus, I guess is what I'm saying. It feels like there's too much going on and not enough is being actually handled. I know we're only two issues in and we're still just setting up the pieces, but like the fact we're throwing Killer Croc into this when we still are just dealing with this whole sword. Like, where does Killer Croc fit into sword fighting? He doesn't. He's Killer Croc. Yeah. So yeah, have some issues. I hope they can be resolved. But this issue in particular, I'm giving it like a 5.5. Eh, it's a little bit better than straight down the middle, but that's only because art I enjoyed and at least I could follow it. Deathstroke number 18, written by Justin Jordan, art by Edgar Salazar. So, last issue, Deathstroke was being hunted by ninjas because he they thought he killed somebody, which he didn't kill. Turns out it was the head of the ninjas who killed him. And then the head of the ninja clan was killed by his son, who was also the guy who's the head of the ninjas, because he actually killed him. Look, it's a whole thing. So, Tomo killed his father because... He doesn't like the way he's running things, and now he's taking his place. And he basically stabs him through with the sword, and he's like, All right, everybody, honor is the old way, and the old way is stupid. Does anybody disagree? If so, step up now, and nobody does. And then the master crawls over to Deathstroke as he's giving his villainous monologue, saying like, Ah, I will take over this clan and lead us into the future. And he crawls over to Deathstroke, and he's like, Deathstroke, I will give you one dollar to avenge my death. And he's like, contract accepted. So now it's Tomo versus Deathstroke. And he's like, dude, you're not going to kill me. And he's like, oh, you don't understand. Whenever I take a contract, I make sure I succeed. And he drops the sword, fires at Tomo. But apparently Tomo is so dedicated to the in with the new stuff that he has taken on cybernetic enhancements on his body. So guns aren't really going to work on him, as aren't most anything else. So he's firing at Deathstroke. He's got augmented strength, so his sword just goes straight through Deathstroke's sword. And he also has to fight ninjas at the same time. So he's a little bit battered, but he's just hoping to basically outpace Tomo until whatever, like, drug or whatever that's hyping him up he's on wears off. Despite the fact that there was no hint that he was ever on a drug. But regardless, Tomo stabs him through the chest and he's like, Ah, you know that I don't stand on tradition. I'm... I'm my own man. And then Deathstroke's like, you know, your clan might care about traditions a bit more. And they all took a contract on the guy who killed Jenner Collins or whatever, which you admitted was you. So then all the ninjas turn on Tomo, gives Deathstroke at least a little bit of an out as he's able to get his bearings again. And Tomo's just making quick work of the ninjas. He's throwing them all around the room. Nobody's able to stand up to him. But Deathstroke eventually charges all of them outside a window and he's like all right we're like a hundred stories up even tomo with his biological stuff when he hits the ground he gonna splat so i win but then he grabs onto the uh windows and a rope that he had ready and he sees that one of the adaptments that tomo got is basically spider-man powers so he's able to just climb up these walls and that's just like crap all right so they start fighting with each other deathstroke's at a disadvantage because the rope holding him up and he's basically just being thrown around by Tomo. Tomo goes and cuts the rope. Deathstroke manages to get on top of Tomo. And Tomo just holds him tight and just be like, I'm going to squeeze you to death. And he's like, oh, yeah? Well, you know, there's... And he goes through this whole extra thing here about, like, your father was honor-bound. And when you're honor-bound, you're willing to die for anything. You... You're not honor bound, so I know that you're always going to want to save your own life, which means you're never willing to take that extra step. And then all of a sudden, the window shatters because of their like combined weight or whatever. And Deathstroke uses Tomo as a cushion to his own fall. So he's shattered three ribs and basically ruptured his spleen. But Tomo's out for the count. There's no way he's surviving it. And Deathstroke makes his way over and he's like, I finished my contract. One dollar, please. And Tomo just mutters out that Lynch lied. And Deathstroke's like, Lynch, wait a minute. I was in that book called Team Seven. And there was a guy named Lynch who was leading that team. Ah, crap. I'm tying in with Team Seven. 
And lo and behold, this does immediately lead into Team 7 number, I think it was 5, where Deathstroke's now hunting down John Lynch. So Justin Jordan's right in both books. It doesn't surprise me that he's taking full advantage of that fact. What do I think of the ninja story? It's fine. It's totally serviceable. There's nothing inherently wrong with it. They do a whole thing on honor and how Deathstroke feels honored to or honor bound to complete these contracts, but also it's for money as well, so it's not 100% honor, but like he also didn't have to take that last contract for the head of the Sukasada clan. That was strictly out of oh, this was an old man who didn't deserve to die, I guess. So it plays with the honor thing a little bit. I appreciate it, a whole out with the old, in with the new, and the fact that technically Deathstroke Slade represents the old because he is part of an older generation. I like the themes they're playing with. I just don't think they go far enough in really making this a deeper metaphor. It's pretty surface level. So overall, I give this one, uh, I give it a solid 6.5. I don't think it's quite at seven range, but it's it's setting up a future thing. I think it's interesting enough. My main concern here, though, is that now we're going on this John Lynch thing. I don't think we're ever going to see the fact that Deathstroke's son, like four issues ago, was going to attack him. Like, where did that just died? That's just gone. I really wanted to see how that gets resolved, but I guess we're just not doing that. But either way. Yeah, this book is canceled at 20, so we got two issues to see how this whole Team 7 thing wraps up. And be sure to check out Team 7 to see the other side of that, because I'm assuming it's just going to be an interweaved story. So, whatever. Suicide Squad number 18, written by Adam Glass, art by Henrik Johnson. Last issue, we had Red Orchid who is Yo-Yo's sister and has plant powers, working with Regulus, leader of Basilisk, who we thought was dead, they have a hostage. And that's who Suicide Squad is after. So Harley's out, she got poisoned, and it looks like the rest of the group is basically all choking on stuff. And Yo-Yo's the only one who's still up and moving. So he lands a punch on Regulus and seemingly gets what's left of the group, which is Voltaic and King Shark, up on their feet and says, okay, here's the deal. Um, King Shark, you eat Regulus. Just devour him whole. Voltaic, go beat up my sister, and then I'm just going to grab the target. So Yo-Yo makes his way over to the package. He's on the comms with... Uh, Waller, and Waller's like, hey, I have cameras in your contact lenses. Give me a confirmation on who this package is. And so Yo-Yo takes the bag off the guy's head and, like, takes two pages to do it. But it's Kurt Lance. And Kurt Lance, for anyone who's unaware, I think has been featured in this book. But regardless, he has the ability to boost or even take away meta abilities. He is just that kind of guy. So he has managed to take away uh, Yo-Yo's ability, at least minorly, because he's just too close. He's not even meaning to, and he also probably has like a lot of concussions. So Voltaic's going up against Red Orchid. Uh, seems like a pretty even fight right up until Red Orchid causes this weird... The best I could describe it is Little Shop of Horrors plant straight from her chest, and it just bites Voltaic's head off. Um... Then King Shark is fighting Regulus, and Regulus is like, Do you even remember who you are, King Shark? Your name is Nanoe. I'm horribly mispronouncing that, but regardless, King Shark's like, Oh yeah, that is who I am. And one of my teammates is... And then they're knocked out by Voltaic, so that's done. Red Orchid has a grip on everybody, saying like, Hey, all right, uh, I did what I needed to do, Regulus. Are we cool now? And Regulus walks up to Deadshot, just being like, Hey... Uh, I really should be thanking you, Deadshot. And Deadshot just spits in his eye. He's like, actually, I, I was going to do that anyway. I needed a DNA sample. And Deadshot's like, what do you... I'm sorry, why do you need a DNA sample? He's just like, oh, why don't you ask Waller? Why don't you ask the real reason she's fighting me? And he's like, because uh, you're a cult leader and a psycho? And it's like, yeah, okay, and other stuff. So Yo-Yo looks over and sees Harley still unconscious. And he's like, I got to snap her out of it. There's only one way I think I can do it. And he swings over to her and 
kisses her on the lips, to which Harley then smacks him in the face. And he's like, oh, I'm sorry, you have to understand that. And she interrupts and just be like, you thought that a kiss would send a shock to my system and wake me up? And he's like, yeah, well, if you knew that, why did you, why'd you smack me? She's like, oh, it was a little bit of foreplay. And he's like, I love you. So at that point, she pulls a uh, knife out of her boot and then starts cutting off the branches that were holding Red Orchid up. And the whole reason that Yo-Yo wanted to wake Harley up is because she doesn't have powers. So she can get Kurt Lance out of here and just be herself in doing it. So she grabs Kurt, but then Regulus comes up from behind, uses a flail to hit her in the back of the head. So I think she should be dead, but she's not. And um, she he grabs Harley by the back of the hair and just like, oh, I know you. You're a follower. You can't lead anybody. You, you need someone to lead you to your full potential. And Harley's like, oh, I guess you haven't heard. I'm a solo act now. And she throws her knife at Kurt's head, knocking him out, thus rendering his powers of power nullification out. And so Yo-Yo is able to escape the binding, gets everybody out as well. And he's like, hey, guys, I was thinking we need a battle cry. How about Suicide Squad Assemble? And that's just like, that's stupid. No one of should ever use that cry. And it's like... Avengers came out last year, didn't it? Got it. Just wanted to make, just wanted to be clear. Okay. Anyway, so at that point, Deadshot takes a shot at the giant aquarium nearby, and so it unleashes this huge flood of water, knocking over uh, Regulus and Harley. Harley manages to get away from Regulus, but then Red Orchid once again just basically grabs everybody, and at Waller pops in and says, like, Deadshot, you need to get the package out of here. You, 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 yeah, I don't have to remind you, I can blow your head off. And it's just like, how about you tell me who our package is, okay? Well, maybe that would help. But then Regulus walks over and takes the little comms off of Deadshot, just being like, hey, uh, thanks for letting me borrow Harley, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and take Kurt. So I hope you understand that, um, this is, this is personal. And she, you, she shuts off the connection and grabs a gun and says, I'm on my way. So Regulus walks out with Kurt and just basically shakes hands with Red Orchid saying, yep, you go ahead, do whatever you need to do, bye. And Red Orchid starts using her branches to go down everybody's throats and just starts suffocating them. Uh, Yo-Yo is left unharmed for the moment, so he uses his stretching ability, wraps his neck around Black Orchid's neck a few times, and tells Deadshot, hey, you know what you gotta do. And Deadshot uses his gun, shoots the micro-explosive inside of Yo-Yo's neck, and blows them both up. So, Yo-Yo's dead. Yo-Yo is definitely dead, and probably Red Orchid as well. But Yo-Yo's dead. Which... I can't say I didn't see coming because he's been given so much focus these past two issues and the fact that it's Yo-Yo, it's like, all right, he's probably able to be killed off. But I do appreciate the fact that they gave him enough focus that I thought maybe he could have been off. Like, I never thought that he was totally safe, but if they gave him like one or two more issues of just like, no, he's leading this team now, I could see it of him actually managing to survive. But yeah, no, he's he was marked for death the moment he took charge. So overall, I'm going to say art was fine. I'm kind of tired of the whole Regulus thing, but they did clarify that, you know, Regulus is grabbing Kurt because Kurt has an ability not only to depower metas, but also to track them to some extent. So he's going to use that to basically destroy everything. I'm a bit tired of the regular stuff, but if he wants to be the main big bad of the series and they're willing to give him the time for it, so be it. I just wish that they would stop doing false endings then because I really thought he was done with by last arc and now they're like, nope, he's actually still here and we're not going to spend any time away from him. Anyway, yeah, overall, I'm going to give this one a... I'll give it just a flat six. It's perfectly normal for what Suicide Squad has been. It didn't really stand out at all. I didn't quite have an emotional punch when Yo-Yo died, so missed opportunity there. But hey, maybe who knows? He is still alive. His ability is to... He managed to survive in King Shark's stomach for like months, so there's a chance at anything, I guess. Team 7, number 6, written by Justin Jordan, art by like four different people, Pascal Alixe, Cliff Richards, Gui Balbi, and Juan Castro. 
So last issue, we had some weird AI office thing. Uh, seemingly something went horribly wrong and everyone was getting taken over by cybernetics. And there was Caitlin Fairchild, the daughter of Alex Fairchild, was like interning there or something. Also, there was this framing device of Deathstroke coming after the team. That's not present here. So just, I don't know, remember that that happened. So Team 7, they're on their plane. They're making their way to the Advanced Prosthetic Research Center, which is where that was all taking place. And the pilot, I forget her name, Ramos, is just like, guys, there ain't nothing in the way. Like, we're just going to make a nice, easy landing and walk in. No problem. There's no problems here at all. And Deathstroke is talking to Fairchild being like, hey, man, your daughter's in there. Are you cool? And he's like, no, no, I'm not cool. This sucks. I, I'm, I'm just mentally preparing for whatever might be in there. And they make the remark that Bronson has not joined them because he basically didn't pick up his phone in time and they have to go in without him. So Ramos is like, all right, we're coming in for a smooth and steady. Ah! And then she's attacked by a cyborg that just busts in through the window and she's bloodied up immediately and they're like okay we're coming in hard um brace for impact so the cyborgs are coming in they're fighting up against it plane crashes and everyone's managed to survive except for ramos and waller comes up being like i'll oh, stay with me ramos and she's like you're not the boss of me Ugh. and so she dies and apparently this is the first person the waller's ever lost in the field and Slade Wilson is just like, well, get used to it because I have a feeling a lot more people are going to be dying before the end of this mission. So, and they look outside and they see just an army of cybernetic uh, people, and they're all saying the same thing: "Caitlin, help me." And Fairchild is not okay with this, considering that Caitlin is his kid. And he's like, "All right, well, whatever. Let's make our way in." So they start blasting. They make their way to the door, and basically bottleneck them out through one of the exits until they're able to make it inside and inside they see just human entrails and body parts and machine parts all just thrown together and it's just like okay nobody move because we don't know what in here is active and what is not and then fairchild sees his daughter walking around the corner and she's like daddy and he's like oh it's my baby I'm, i've got to go hug my child and so he runs in gives her a hug and saying oh i was so worried i thought they got you and then turns out Fairchild is also a cyborg. She stabs her father through the stomach. And everyone freaks out like, oh, God, he's dead. Um, Waller tries to hold back Wilson. And it's like, oh, you don't know what she's capable of. you got to stay back before we can get something. And he's like, nah, my friend just died. I'm going in. So Wilson starts chasing down Fairchild as she starts running. And Grifter is told to follow suit. So they end up having a fight scene, Wilson and Fairchild. The only thing she can say is daddy over and over again. And so as Wilson gets the upper hand, rips off her arms, she looks up at him and says, daddy? And he's like, nope. Boom. Shoots her in the head. And the rest of the team's like, all right, well, that was messed up. Anyway, is anyone else feeling this is like too easy? It feels like they're leading us away from something. And... Waller looks into the schematics and says, oh, you're right, this is a distraction. We should be going the other way because the other way is. And then in walks a giant behemoth of flesh and technological parts. And turns out it's Dr. Henshaw, Hank Henshaw. He still has his mind, though. And he's like, hi, they were leading you away from me. I'm Dr. Henshaw. I was the lead uh, geneticist here. Um, we had a thing called the Spartan Subject kind of got away from us and did all of this i managed to protect my own consciousness due to some safety protocols we have in place but it's fighting oh boy it's trying to get in right now so uh yeah it was just waiting for the arrival of its primary command and everyone's like what do you mean primary command what's up and he's like oh well the spartan was waiting for you team seven and turns out that they didn't even want all of team seven they wanted just bronson and Spartan got tired of waiting for Team 7 to show up, so it went out on its own, and it tracked down Bronson. And the team's like, crap, how far away is Bronson, and what's he doing right now? Turns out that Bronson is pretty far away, but he's having a nice family dinner, and he's like, hey guys, I, my phone's blowing up, I really should get going. And they're like, oh, hush, you're gonna have dinner at the very least. And his grandmother or whatever, sorry, his mother, walks out of the room, walks in the kitchen, and sees one of the cybernetic freaks there. And she freaks out. Bronson jumps up into action. And the cybernetic thing says, initiating core transfer to primary. And 
seemingly does a massive explosion that just takes out the entire apartment. But then he follows up with meta activated. And it turns out that Bronson seems to be a meta that now has his mental stuff overwritten from this Spartan subject. So now he's no longer Bronson. He is whatever this new superhero, supervillain thing is. So interesting. And at the end of last issue, uh, we had Deathstroke and Lynch talking, and they said something along the lines of, oh, no, he's still alive. So I'm willing to put money on the fact that that's Bronson who will be coming back. So we'll see how that happens. Um, overall, it's a fine issue. It managed to follow it pretty well. I do like that this is the first time that, you know, there are casualties. People die. And I think that's mostly due to the fact that at this point, we know this comic is getting canceled. It's only going to issue seven. So, yeah. It's, uh, or maybe it's issue eight. I could be wrong. I genuinely can't remember what this one gets canceled at. Uh, issue eight. So yeah, it's got two more issues in it. And yeah, I like the fact that they're going out at least with a bang. They've set up this thing of, okay, there's this other beast going on. It's crossing over to Deathstroke's book, mildly. It's a whole big thing. I enjoy that. My only criticism here is the fact that Team 7 leading up to this book felt like such a big, huge deal that we were doing all this tie-in stuff. Like, oh, you remember your Team 7 days? And it's like, all right, if this is all we were going to end up getting out of it, it kind of seems like a waste. But I understand that's not the writer's fault that's editorials. So what are you going to do? All in all, it's a... Uh... I don't want to say 7, but I did enjoy swaths of it so i think i am actually going to give it just the flat seven i think this issue it did a fine enough job of setting up you know these characters the threat at hand the only thing that i have any major hang up about is that bronson seems to be this whole big thing now but i mean out of the original cast him and i think it was higgins are the only ones that i had zero recollection of so could have done a little bit better of getting the other characters more star power instead of just focusing on Deathstroke, but hey, too little too late. The Ravagers issue 10, written by Michael Allen Nelson and Tony Bedard, art by Ig Guara and Diogenes Nevis. So last issue, last two issues, we had that whole thing about the Ravagers versus Rose Wilson and Warblade in that weird little town. And Harvest discovered that Rose and Warblade went off script and he's pissed off with them. This issue picks up with Harvest talking to Deathstroke, basically hiring him to take out all of the Ravagers, like our team, not his team. And he's like, yep, so if you have everything you need, the only thing you have left to take is this, Mr. Wilson. And he's like, oh, the uh, out." A bio blade, a bio blade. I don't know. Regardless, he's like, I don't want to use it. I want to use my own sword. And he's like, Well, I'm paying you a lot of money, and you're going to use this damn sword, okay? And he's like, Fine, whatever. I'll take your sword. So then we cut over to Rose and Warblade, who are currently fighting off a bunch of Harvest goons. And Warblade's like, Oh my God, Harvest turned on us. And it's like, No, clearly he knows that we betrayed him. That's obviously what's happening here. And it's like, okay, well, if he knew that, he would be sending out the big guns right now instead of all these goons. And then all of a sudden, this giant warship appears out of nowhere, shoots down a bunch of what are called butcher bots that are just tiny little drones that are going to kill them all. And Rose is like, you were saying? So then we cut to the Ravagers, who are still inside the safe house. And Thunder's basically just telling a funny story about how there was this one guy with Harvest who was like a bloodhound he had a really keen sense of smell and he gave beast boy a hard time all the time so beast boy one day turned into a skunk and sprayed him and it didn't make it any easier for beast boy but boy was it funny and he's like hey thanks for telling that story in front of tara here she's gonna call me like fart boy from now on and tara's like actually i think it was pretty smart so then caitlin turns to miles calder and it's like hey they're actually laughing about their time in harvest this is great like, you've actually made them feel safe. And so Ridge walks out of the room and he's like, ah, so funny, you guys. I'm so glad I have friends like you. And then all of a sudden, he freezes up and shrinks down into the form of a small boy. And I mean, like, six years old. And then we see uh, him calling out to Tara, saying like, oh, 
Tara, could you come here for a minute? And it's like, Ridge, why do you sound so funny? So then we get the story from Beast Boy saying, hey, remember that time when I caught your sister raiding the fridge? And Thunder's like, hey, remember that time that my sister saw a red mouse watching her in the shower? And Beast Boy's like, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. That, that wasn't me at all. But uh, By the way, I'm sorry for bringing up your sister. And Thunder's like, hey, don't worry about it. I think it's good to think about her now. It's, it's, she may be lost, but it's, it's nice to talk about her. So then they ask if Niles and Caitlin have any funny stories to share. And Niles is about to share one. And then Caitlin just immediately shoots him down, just being like, I've never done anything embarrassing in my entire life. And you're not going to ignore anything this man says. And then Tara re-enters the room and is like, guys, uh, we need to check on Ridge here. And they come across the small boy and he's like, hello, do you happen to have any Legos in this place? And Caitlin's like, hello, small child, how did you get into this safe house? And it's like, oh, it's me, it's Ridge. I, I'm a boy. I'm a real boy now. And Niles is like, okay, so A, it turns out that you weren't really a teen, you were a child. And B, your, ravaged, your form that we were all familiar with is strictly due to feeling threatened. And now that you're calm and in a safe place, you just turn back into a normal kid. And just like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, cool. So they want to run some tests. Beast Boy and Terror are talking, and they're just like, oh, wow, do you even remember what it's like being a kid? No? How about we go out and hit the town? Let's have fun. So cut back to Rose and Warblade. They're about to get overrun by these butcher bots when Warblade gets the idea to go into the ship that they arrived on, have the butcher bots follow them in, have the ship self-destruct, and then they just take an escape pod out. And all of that happens, and it, they're like, okay, so the only way to get back into Harvest's good graces is to bring back his runaway Ravagers. So we have to go get them, or else we're going to die. So then we cut to Los Angeles, where Terry and Beast Boy are on a quote-unquote date, and like she holds Beast Boy's hand, and he's like, humming a humming a humming I can't believe this, but there's so many people watching them because he stands out in the crowd. And then Tara, as they're inside a toy store, uh, Tara turns to Beast Boy and be like, hey, you know, we've been out on sound for a while here. Why haven't you tried to kiss me yet? And Tara's like, uh-oh, I guess people are watching. And Beast Boy's like, let him watch. And so he plants one on Tara. So then we see Niles talking to Thunder, who's having another one of his migraines. And he's like, hey, you got a migraine. That's cool. Uh, I need you to come with me real quick. And he's like, okay, sure, whatever. So they go into this big old scary looking chair and he's like uh i really don't want to sit in the scary looking chair it's like you don't have to i just need you in this room to scan your brain and then they activate the chair and as it turns out lightning is back he, he brought lightning back to life and thunder runs over and hugs her and just being like oh is it really you you're alive and we see tara and beast boy re-arriving from their date ridge runs up and he's like hey did you get anything for me it's like matter of fact we bought you some legos and he's like awesome so then they enter into the kitchen, they see that lightning's alive, and they get the full scientific explanation that apparently it was due to this psychic link and then quantum fluctuations and blah, 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 lightning is alive and it's actually genuinely her. So Caitlin's like, all right, well, everything's been going great. I'm sure nothing's going to bring us down now. So then that night, Ridge is going to the fridge, he's getting some food, and he all of a sudden gets a flash of his mother being pregnant. And it turns out that Ridge was not only taken as a child, he was literally taken from his mother's womb and has been raised in harvest care since. And he's like, oh my God, I have a mother. I'm so happy. And then Deathstroke comes up from behind him and kills him. He kills a seven-year-old boy. He sticks the knife through Ridge's back and he bursts into flames and dies. And Deathstroke just says, one down. So, like, isn't that just the thing in storytelling? When anybody has it too good for too long, immediately things are going to go south. I, I get that. That's obvious that that's going to happen. But the fact that they opened it with killing Ridge, who only just now is like, I'm a real boy, and I have a mother, and I can remember her, and I can find her. Oops. That feels so much more extra than it needed to be. But I also kind of love it. Like... The fact that it's like, no, the world has constantly crapped all over you, and they will continue to do so. Don't ever think you're going to be happy. 
anyway, um, yeah, it's it's a fine enough issue. I mean, I don't really have any problems with it, but it is kind of a setting up for the final couple issues here because this one did get canceled at issue 12, so we've only got two left on that. It's going to be interesting to see which Ravagers actually managed to make it to the end of this. Uh, if you've been keeping up with Team 7, Caitlin Fairchild seemingly is not herself because they had a whole thing where the actual Caitlin may have died. So I don't know, maybe Harvest was part of that book or something like that. But regardless, there's a lot going on. I'm sure we'll unpack it all. But for this particular issue, I'll give it a... I'll give it a 7. It's very low 7, but it is still a 7. So looking forward to seeing how these last two issues manage to wrap up this book that, frankly, I felt had no purpose of existing at the beginning, but it's kind of won me over a little bit in recent issues. So kudos on that. Demon Knights, number 18, written by Robert Venditti, art by Bernard Chang. So last issue, the few Demon Knights we did have, Exteristos, Horsewoman, and Shining Knight, brought Jason Blood to Xanadu, and they found her by following a map. They didn't even expect to find her. And so this issue, we have the reuniting, and it's just like, oh my god, what did you guys do to him? Did you force him? Force him to bring you here because we swore we would never tell anyone else about this place. And it's like, nah, he's been held captive by Vandal Savage for years. Like, we we just saved him. So watch your tone, man. Anyway, if you unmute him, he'll tell you exactly that. And he's like, okay, well, I will. And you better hope he does. And so she unmutes Jason and Jason coughs out some dust. And then just like, oh, Xanadu, my love. I, I'm so happy to see you again. And they kiss each other. And it's just like, yeah, no, Vandal Savage did it. He's a dick. Uh, but there's kind of a bigger thing going on. And everyone else interrupts. is like, yeah, we got a vampire army that's currently trying to invade the Amazonian island. So, Jason, uh, we need you to pull a natural again. And Jason's like, I'm sorry, what? You want me to turn it? I literally just got out of the hell that is Vandal Savage. You want me to switch places with that? You're going to go down to hell. You don't think that I could fight? I can fight. I'm strong. And Horse, <laughs> horse Lady's horse is like, this guy's kind of a bit of a whiny bitch. And she's like, yeah, kind of is. And so then he turns on Xanadu and just be like, I get it. You brought me back, but it turns out that you just wanted Etrigan, didn't it? And Xanadu's like, no, what are you talking about? I love you. I hate Etrigan. Etrigan sucks. And he's like, Vandal Savage told me all about how you were canoodling with him. So don't, I'm on to you, woman. I'm aware. And Horsewoman basically steps in being like, hey, uh, we are kind of low on time. So if you could just either nut up or shut up, I, I, that'd be great. So Jason's like, I don't like any of you. You all are dicks. But you know what? Fine. You need Atrigan, so be it. But just remember, this is what you wanted. And so he turns into Atrigan, and Atrigan's like, oh, hey, I'm back. I can't wait to destroy the Earth a little bit. And Shining Knight's like, not so fast, Atrigan, stand down. And so he pulls out a sword ready to fight. And then Xanadu steps up being like, oh, there's no need to fight, my love. We all wanted you back, especially me. And so they kiss and someone's like, oh, God, not this again. And Etrigan's like, oh, do you maybe want to get out of here? Or better yet, let them watch. And he's like, uh, no. Later. Uh, actually, we have a vampire army that's attacking, and so we got to go deal with that. And Etrigan's like, oh, Cain, right? Yeah, I've been hearing rumblings about Cain and how Lucifer doesn't even have any hold over him. I'm totally into hearing about this. And... All of a sudden, the Falcon arrives. They think it's from Algebir. They open it up, and it turns out that Cain has basically made his way to the Amazonian Isle. Uh, he's far closer than they are, and they don't think there's any way they're going to be able to catch up. And so at that point, uh, Horsewoman's horse is like, hey, I, I can go. Like, we can go all day and night. Don't count me out just because I'm a mill horse. And so he's... Horsewoman's like, uh, Brick Wedge is up for it. Everyone else wants to go flying. And it's like, yep, sure, let's do it. So they go to the shores of Greece. It takes them a few days and nights, but they manage to get there. And as they arrive, they're like, all right, let's set up some defenses. We're going to we're gonna wait for the army to attack us here because we can't actually go to the Amazonian Isle, so we have to fight them on the shore. And then Sir Euston looks across the dune, and they're like, um, guys, the fight's already going on. 
and we see a bunch of Amazonians fighting some vampires. And so demon knights jump in and they're like, oh, crap, Exteristos, what do you do? You were exiled. What are you doing back here? And it's like, ah, screw it, just fight. So at that point, uh, they get the breakdown. The only way to kill them is to pierce their heart and cut off their head. That's the only thing that does it. And so the one Amazonian's like, you should have brought a sharper weapon, Exteristos. And she's like, don't worry, you handle the hearts. I'll just knock their heads off with my giant hammer. So they go through the whole thing, hard head, hard head. Etrigan ends up burning a few of them to ashes, and they end up taking out the whole of the vampire squad. Uh, one of the Amazons gets infected, and the, th by the way, this is the Amazonian shore guard, which, yeah, all right, why not? Uh, the leader of the shore guard named Atla, she steps up and is just like, we got to kill her. She's going to turn into one of them. We got to do it now. And so she kills her sister, gives her the two coins for the river sticks, and is just like, all right, the only reason we managed to survive is because it was dawn and they're weaker in the daylight. But if night falls, we're screwed, man. Like, they're going to be able to take out the whole island. And at this point, Etrigan kind of collapses, and he's like, all right, guys, I've been out for a few days now. I need to go back to hell and recharge, so just call me when the fight starts because <laughs> no way Jason's going to be able to handle it. But then as he goes back... He's not able to go back. And Xanadu's like, Jason's not letting me go back to hell. What's going on down there? And we see down in hell, Lucifer's talking to Jason. He's like, hey, buddy, super cool how you tortured Etchigan by not letting him go back up to Earth for a while. Really love that. Anyway, um, enjoy hell. You're going to be stuck here for a little bit. And he's like, actually, Lucifer, I've suffered the worst possible tortures that Vandal Savage could think of. I'm just going to stay here in hell. Like, what more could you do to me? He's like, I'm sorry, you're you're choosing to stay in hell? Yes. Everyone up there thinks I'm weak. I'm going to show them how strong I am by literally withstanding hell. So that's going on. Meanwhile, the uh, Amazonian shore guard are chopping down trees, trying to make a boat fast enough to cross over to Amazon because all the vampires took their boats. And turns out that the guide that's leading the vampires is actually an old lover of Exoristos. So... Yeah, there or sorry, friendship. So either way, that really pisses off pisses off Exoristos. She just punches down a tree. Etrigan's like, "Oh, I'm so weak. Please, Xanadu, you gotta get me back to hell." And she's just like, "Okay, you're, could we maybe not be such a little bitch?" Um, but then, wouldn't you know it, on the shores arrives Vandal Savage, and he's like, oh, "Hey, where's my uh?" Where's my little play thing? I want to I wanna take him back and I'm going to kill all of you because you made a fool out of me. So then we cut over to Themyscira for one last thing. Uh, the patrol on the island sees the ships arriving and they're like, that's weird. They shouldn't be coming back until next week. Let's alert the uh, soldiers. Make sure that they're everything's all right. And we see Kane and the other vampires on the boat saying, all right, everyone, sharpen your fangs. We're going to war. So overall, I mean, fantastic issue i appreciate that we're not just wasting time where we don't need to and the fact that no they were just straight up too late like they wasted too much time on all of their bs and they were having to follow that x to xanadu like they just wasted too much time i appreciate that fact if it's not just conveniently working out admittedly they make it to this battle enough to save the amazonian shore guard but I'll take it where I can get it. Um, Art-wise, looks great. Don't have any main problems with that. Bernard Chang, fantastic artist. Writing, again, no problems. It is kind of just the middle issue where we're setting up, all right, here's the different things that are going on. There's no climactic fight by the end, and there's no beginning of the arc mystery. It's just kind of getting from A to B and making sure all the pieces are in place for that final fight, which does feel like it's going to be within the next issue or two. So I'm at least intrigued. Overall, eh, I'd say 7.5. It's it's good. It's not super standout, but it is a little bit above average quality, especially for what I consider from this book. It's been very good no matter what. And that's it. That's all the comics that came out from DC Comics this March 13th, 2013. And you remember at the beginning when I was saying, hey, 12 comics, isn't that so super awesome? <laughs> There's 16 coming out next week. And not only are there 16, there is an oversized and a new number one. So 
Love it. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and start resting my voice, but not before I tell you what the comics coming out next week are. So, we have the number 18 issues of Batwoman, Birds of Prey, Catwoman, Nightwing, Red Hood and the Outlaws, Action Comics, Supergirl, Green Lantern, New Guardians, DC Universe Presents, Justice League, Wonder Woman, and Legion of Superheroes. Additionally, we have the number two issues of Justice League of America and Justice League of America's Vibe. Again, not a sex thing. And the number six issue of Sword of Sorcery. And then on top of it, we're getting a brand new number one with Con Constantine, fresh from his Vertigo run, popping on over into the New 52. I'm not saying I dislike any of those titles outright, but why do we have to have them all at once? That's... I had 12 this week, DC. You could just move some over and I would be a little bit complainy, but not nearly as complainy as I am now. Anyway, if anybody is still listening to this, thank you. Thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, we have a Discord. We have a Patreon. We have a subreddit. Oh, yeah, Twitter. I keep forgetting that's a thing because I really don't like using it now that it's gone to crap. But uh, we do have all those things. Check them out in the description. But that's going to do it for me. Thank you very much for watching, listening, however it is you consume this podcast. Be sure to tune in to next week's episode where I slowly break down over the course of an hour and 45 minutes to two hours. And, uh... As always, if it ain't broke, don't fix it.